huge revelation today. This is amazing, right? He's out there peddling his book, and he's all about the facts and the truth and getting his story out. And so uh, here's what happened with Savannah Guthrie when she raised the question of this 25th Amendment thing. Let's talk about some of the more explosive revelations that are in this book. They have to do with Rod Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general. You write in the book that Rosenstein, I believe on more than one occasion, you say, suggested wearing a wire, that he himself would wear a wire into the Oval Office to record the president. Mm -hmm. Savannah, actually, I don't include that in my book. I made the decision not to put those specific words in the book. I don't discuss the 25th Amendment, the allegations about the 25th Amendment in the book for a really important reason. It's become quite a distraction. (laughs) Wow. Okay. It's not in the book because it's become a distraction. Joining us now to discuss this, uh, Victor Davis has said, of course, military historian, columnist, uh, and now a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Brand new book, by the way. The Case for Trump is coming out March 5th. You can pre-order it now. Your article at American Greatness is Autopsy of a Dead Coup. Uh, you're, you're using the C word on this one. You think it was a coup? Yeah, I do. I think we're reluctant to use that word, but you had the, de- the acting head of the FBI and the acting head of the DOJ, at least in terms of the Mueller investigation, that were actively discussing a way to remove the President of the United States and by that, I mean, had they thought that there was a majority of cabinet members, they probably would have pursued that more concretely. And they were completely acting out of the constitutional norms in the sense that the 25th Amendment is only for an incapacitated Woodrow Wilson, like Coma or FDR uh, on his last legs or Eisenhower recovering from a, a, an office. That was what it was intended to prevent. Right. And... So that's what they were trying to do, and I think they would have done it had they thought that there was majority support in the cabinet. Even even if you uh, go the route of of suggesting the 25th Amendment uh, by saying mentally incapacitated means that the president is not of sound mind, not a health reason, but just, you know, off his rocker or whatever kind of idiom you want to use or euphemism you want to use, it's certainly not something that's supposed to be instigated and coordinated and orchestrated by uh, by bureaucrats. That's that's what they are, right? They're just government employees yeah. who have a lot well, of power. Yeah. We have a constitutional remedy, and that's members of the House of Representatives are so alarmed at presidential behavior that they pass a writ of impeachment, and then that goes to the Senate where there's a trial. And that's a very carefully – it's a difficult process because the founders didn't want you to – just remove the will of the people at any person's whim. And so they were really acting, as I said, unconstitutionally. But they were buoyed by the idea that there had been talk. We had a Yale, uh, you remember a Yale psychiatrist would testify before Congress. There were celebrities saying Trump is crazy. There were columnists uh, writing that he was on balance. Oh, oh, because I, I, they, I, I remember that press conference, that extraordinary press conference with yes. uh, the president's personal doctor, where they, they grilled him and asked him, you know, to, is he nuts? Uh, it's crazy. Yeah, and what they didn't see was it was, uh, they did see it, but this was a pattern. They, Jill Stein sued on the three states voting machines right after the election. Then they tried to run ads to subvert the electoral college that the electors were not supposed to follow their state's mandates. Then they said that Trump had made out like a bandit, even though he lost a billion dollars, we learned, at, under the emoluments clause. There was a 25th Amendment. There were particular lawsuits uh, that were uh, aimed at stopping his programs. There was 60 House members that voted for impeachment. There was assassination chic talk from Johnny Depp, Snoop Dogg, Madonna, Kathy Griffith, all that. And it was all aimed at basically removing or at least driving the president or driving his polls so far down that he would not be an effective commander-in-chief. And that's that's the landscape that this opportunist McCabe was oper- operating in. As a uh, as a military historian and a classics professor, you have written, uh, going back to the ancient Greeks, uh, through World War II and everything in between, um, th- this is not a new story. Uh, this sort of thing has happened before. Maybe it hasn't happened in the United States of America. But do you see any uh, uh, similarities in what we saw transpire here in the months after the president's inauguration or after the president's election and other moments in America or world history, I should say, where there have been these attempts to oust the leader? 
Well, there has been all during the 1930s. That was the modus operandi in places in the 20s with Mussolini and the Japanese militaries took over the government in Japan. We've seen it all during the 1960s and 70s in Latin America, right after the colonial period in Africa. But we always thought we were above that. That uh, Remember, that these were not shaggy Marxists, as I wrote. These were not corporate people planning something in their jets. These were not military guys with sunglasses and chested medals. These were straight arrow, uh, higher loyalty, James Comey, the threat, Andrew McKay, FBI agents. But we, we don't even know what's going on. We've had 25 of the FBI and DOJ people resign or retire or be reassigned. So they took it upon themselves, thinking that the public would be behind them to dilute a FISA court, to lie to federal investigators to try to wear a wire maybe and trap the president in the way that uh, James Comey tried to entrap him with those presidential private memos he was leaking, to leak to the press. Andrew McCabe, I was very disturbed about the 60-minute interview. It was like a high school journalism class. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pelley did not say to him one time, you ordered your New York FBI office to run an investigation for leaks as you were basically accusing them of breaking the law, all as a cover to hide the fact that you were leaking. And you were reprimanded by your own subordinate and said, you know, you wasted all these resources. So he's not a very good, not nice guy. And then when he talked about his wife's conflict of interest, it was, I didn't know whether to cry or laugh, <laughs> because he seems to think that if your wife runs for office and she's a rep- recipient of a record $700,000 from Clinton-affiliated PACs, and you wait more than six months, then you run an investigation of Hillary Clinton. There's no conflict of interest, and anybody suggests there is is somehow disloyal or, or treacherous or treason. And then he started attacking today the inspector general. This is a guy who's made a case the last year that Trump is uncouth for even suggesting the FBI was not upright, and now he's saying that the independent inspector general is corrupt. Right. Oh, it's it's really I, I quite a performance. <laughs> now, go ahead. You were saying he's lost all... I, I think we've lost all respect, don't you, for the yeah. James Comey, Andrew McKay, Peter Strzok, Lisa well, Page, James Clapper, John Brennan. They've all lied under oath, or they've, they've committed felonious behavior. And I think now people are saying, you know what, just because they have a tie and a suit and somebody on CNN or says, that's... Well, I know Bob Miller. He's I, I, uh, I know... Robert, you wouldn't do that. Or right. I know uh, Andy McCabe, he's a great guy. Or Jim Comey, you know, he and I, that doesn't mean anything to anybody anymore. They, they've lost their, their reputations that we should believe them, I think. Our guest is Victor Davis Hanson. His latest article is called Autopsy of a Dead Coup. Uh, what I found chilling about uh, Andrew McCabe's uh, presentation before the media in the last couple of days and James Comey's endless book tour that he went on is that they both had the same kind of message, which was uh, all of these actions that they took, these extraordinary actions that we're learning about now, investigating a president, even discussing removing a president, It was all done to protect the country. It was done to protect the nation and protect the Constitution. It's almost Orwellian, uh, if you think about it. But again, historically, that's what the generals responsible for a coup always say, right? They're the real patriots. Absolutely. That's why it was such an insult. I lived in Greece for three years, and, and I saw the 73 coup, and I saw I came after the 67 coup. And that was what was so insulting, because I can't think of a revolutionary in history who ever said, I'm doing this to grab power, gain attention, and get my friends and my fellow kindred politi- politicos in power. That's, but that's what they do. They just assume that nobody wants to hear that. Hmm. So we're supposed, for the first time in history, to believe that he's acting, Comey and his associates, and McCabe acting on a higher loyalty. It was just ludicrous. That's what... It was just boilerplate rhetoric that they all say. Well, and, and if, you know, I, I try my best uh, when I look at an issue where I know I disagree with uh, political opponents and other people in the media. I try my best to put myself in their shoes and really at least understand why they believe what they believe. I'm having a lot of trouble reconciling not just people looking at this Andrew McCabe, James Comey and this whole fiasco and not seeing it the way I see it, but but they see it so differently 
the media actually has bought into this idea. They've become a big part of this messaging, haven't they, Victor Davis Hanson, that, that, that we I need men they're... like James Comey and Andrew McCabe? I think they assume that Trump's appearance, his accent, his estrangement from both the Republican and Democratic establishments, the manner in which he speaks, uh, even though his agenda has been pretty good, it's been pretty traditionally conservative, nonetheless, they thought, you know what, by going after Trump or holding his decapitated head up on a, a video or joking about, you know, burning him up, or whatever it was with the celebrities, or whatever it was with diluting a FISA court, it was okay because people would agree with them. And that they also, when they did this during the campaign, they were they just were assumed that Hillary was going to win, and she would either reward or uh, not look too deeply into their illegal behavior. Then mm. after the election, they recalibrate and said, you know what, we can continue to do this on the principle that this guy's a threat, and we can drive it, drive his. Um, positives down to the low 30s and then people will by acclamation praise us Hmm. and i don't think anybody what i really resented the most as i watched this last two years with this preemptive um exemption you don't dare ever say one thing about bob Mueller. do not dare say anything about jim comey this is the fbi this is the special counsel this is the fisa court how dare you say and i and when i would be interviewed or right people would attack that and say you should be ashamed of yourself And then when they get in that same position, they denounce the presidency, they denounce the inspector general, they denounce anybody they please. And uh, I think they're so sanctimonious and self-righteous that they've overplayed their hand and they've turned a lot of people off. Well, and the idea of an individual with the kind of power to wield, as a a James Comey had or a Robert Mueller currently has, and to suggest that they are unaccountable and, and beyond criticism is really counter to any kind of uh, Democratic Republic principle that we've held in America since the beginning. I mean, everybody was up for scrutiny. I think so. And I think if you just look at Robert Mueller's own standards of what he applied to Michael Flynn or Carter Page or any of these people that he went after at one time or another, by that same standard, uh, James um, Clapper or John Brennan, but especially Andrew McCabe, and Comey are very susceptible because they have done things. I mean, if if Michael Flynn on 245 occasions had told under oath a House Intelligence Committee or Joint Committee that he couldn't remember or didn't know, yeah, Bob Mueller would have brought him up on even more perjury charges. Yeah. And if anybody had gone to a FISA court and not told them that the primary evidence, A, was from a guy who was had been dismissed, Steele, was unverified, was used in circular fashion with news accounts for further evidence, and most importantly, was paid for by Hillary Clinton through two firewalls, we would have it all over the New York Times, and it would say, you know, Mueller just about ready to indict this person for defrauding or obstructing a a FISA court. Yeah. So it's the asymmetry that seems so dangerous or scary or surreal. Real fast, Victor Davis Hanson, sadly we only have about a minute or so left, but the headline is autopsy of a dead coup. But the Mueller investigation is still going on. And and for all we know, there could still be an FBI investigation going on. We don't know. And God knows Adam Schiff has an investigation that's going to go on until the 2020 election. This isn't really a dead coup. It's still going, isn't it? It is. Uh, my point was, I think that the, the momentum has passed, though, when you have the Senate Judiciary uh, intelligence committee basically saying they couldn't find anything when you have uh, left-wing reporters like michael iskoff saying they couldn't find anything when you saw struck say there was no there there i think people are starting to come to the conclusion they're waking up and i think you'll see the mechanics continue but i don't think there'll be the zeal i don't think they believe it anymore they're going through the motions now i think they're afraid i think there's going to be a backlash and they're all scrambling to get lawyers and turn on each other. I, I expect that they'll all be testifying against each other. Well, soon. we shall see, uh, and it'll be interesting. Either way, I'm looking forward to your uh, observations in your columns that you write at American Greatness as well as National Review. And I'm very much looking forward to your new book, The Case for Trump, well, comes out you. March 5th. We'll have to have you back to talk about the book. Yeah, I'll enjoy it. Thank all right. You. Thank you, sir. Victor Bye. Davis Hansen. And again, the article is The Autopsy of a Dead Coup.